Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to this uh, third and concluding lecture on rights that we have been discussing and today we are going to focus on human rights particularly and in the second part we will discuss briefly about uh, the relationship between rights and duties and then we will conclude this lecture. So, uh, focusing on human rights, uh, the idea or the premise of human rights discourse is based on this principle of every individual having same or equal moral worth and therefore, they have certain rights which is inalienable or which cannot be differentiated uh, on the basis of their birth, their class, their caste, religion, language and so on. So, uh, human rights discourse assume that all individual because of him or her being member of humanity has certain rights and these rights have certain overriding um, power. Overriding power means that suppose in a domestic um, politics, there is a constitution which guarantees certain rights to individuals, we call it fundamental rights. And if the state or the government enact certain legislation which takes away those rights, then fundamental rights uh, have overriding power to nullify those acts or legislation passed by the parliament which takes away or which curtails those rights which is guaranteed by the constitution. In the similar way, the premise of human rights uh, discourse is that these rights have certain overriding power to uh, suspend, to curtail or to limit those ordinary laws or uh, policies of the state which takes away uh, these rights. So, uh, human rights um, in that sense um, is the prince based on the principle that every individual has certain basic rights that is recognized and protected simply by virtue of him or her being human. So, there is no other criteria required for the protection of these rights. These rights are guaranteed, recognized and must be protected simply because a person is human being and not because he or she is a member of any particular community. So, uh, it means that to have those rights, individuals need not to be a member of a state or a community or culture. Now, the hard facts is all individual must be simultaneously also be a member of a particular community, be it a state or society or community or religious groups or so on. So, individual is uh, in actual uh, circumstances, in actual practical uh, existence are also a member of a particular community. However, the premise of these rights are based not because of the individual is member of a particular community, but because that individual or that person is member of humanity, he is a uh, human being. So, the discourse on human rights is very different from say what we have discussed in the previous lecture about legal rights or citizenship rights or the rights which is guaranteed by a state to its member, to its citizen. Now, human rights discourse transcend those boundaries of nation and state and include every single individual on the planet and uh, the human rights discourse as we will discuss tries to include within its fold uh, uh, different communities, different race, different religions and other kind of communities and groups within it. 
uh, within its fold. So, um, uh, so there is this uh, dichotomy where uh, the human rights discourse assume certain rights which is or should be recognized as inalienable that rights are based not because that individual or person is a member of a particular community, but because simply he or she is a human being. It is granted to them simply because they are human and there are no discrimination on the grounds of nationality, race, caste, class, gender or religion. So, in the human rights discourse, there is no such discrimination on ground of any of these or all of these uh, put together. So, uh, the rights that we are going to discuss, different kinds of rights do not discriminate among the groups or the individual on the basis of any of these like uh, nationality or race or caste, class, gender or religion. So, uh, now uh, looking at the uh, origin of this idea of human rights, one can trace its origin in say natural right theory of enlightenment thinking from 16th to 18th century. So, in the natural right theory as we have discussed, the assumption was that individual before joining a society or forming a state was living in a condition of a state of nature and in that state of nature also human being had certain rights and those rights therefore must not be or cannot be curtailed or limited by the society or state because they have not uh, guaranteed those rights. Those rights individual have be, uh, on the basis of the natural rights, the rights which is based on the natural law. So, we can trace this origin in that uh, natural right theory. However, it was only in the 20th century and more particularly after the second world war and the persecution or genocide or mass killing or the large scale uh, crimes that was committed during uh, the uh, second world war, particularly by the Nazi regime uh, and the trials that followed, there, they, there emerged a new discourse about protecting certain rights which should be uh, 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 which should be overriding, which should be uh, promoted and protected in all the contexts for every single individual and especially those who are vulnerable, those who are helpless. And in that context, there is the uh, provision also uh, to interfere in the matters of the internal affairs of the state in the name of protecting rights. Of course, it is misused and that makes the human rights discourse a bit uh, challenging. However, the human rights discourse has the provision of a legitimate interference in the internal matters of a state to protect the communities and people from the persecution from the human rights violation committed by their own state or the, uh, or the government. So, the uh, specific location or emergence of human rights discourse is during the second world war after the Nuremberg uh, trial where uh, many crimes, especially crimes against humanity was discovered and uh, there emerge a kind of consensus how to curtail, limit or um, persecute those uh, criminal acts. So, it was only in the 20th century that human rights becomes the central concerns in political discourse and since then there is the continuous emergence, structuring, institutional formation to protect or to make individual groups, communities and state aware about their certain human rights. So, the fundamental of human rights is based on the principle that each life matters and carries same or equal moral worth. So, that is the very fundamental premise of human rights discourse. And since in its declaration on December 10, 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, henceforth we will refer to it UDHR, has initiated fires debates in the domestic politics of each signatory or even non signatory states as well as in the global politics about protecting these basic rights of the individual. Now, human rights are complex and contested sets of universal rights. So, these rights are by default universal, it applies to everyone. However, these rights are very complex and contested and as we move on to discuss the articles of human rights declaration, we get to know 
that there is a conflict between political rights and the civil rights or political rights and the civil rights on the one hand and the socio-economic rights on the other hand and the groups and communities rights on the other hand and also how to uh, curtail or reasonably limit uh, some of these rights to maintain uh, peace or harmony or morality in the society and the community. So the discourse on rights as we have been uh, discussing in previous two lectures is not conclusive. There is a conflict, there is a constant evolution and the often uh, two rights are at conflict with each other and some rights which is negative and positive that also create another kind of tensions which we have discussed in the previous lecture. So human rights are complex and contested sets of universal rights which tries to organize the relationship between three uh, set of actors. One is individual, then the society or community and finally the state. So human rights discourse tries to manage or organize the relationship between the individual, society and state. So the assumptions being that individual is of same or equal moral worth, but that individual constantly or simultaneously live in a society or within a state. So these claims that individual has is not um, only against other individual or the society but more importantly against the state and state therefore remains a kind of uh, 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 contesting or contradictory element in this whole discourse where states are um, uh, expected to protect or uphold these rights. However, states are also seen more often than not the violator of these rights. Now, in these circumstances, how to ensure effectively or implement the human rights uh, remain one of the biggest challenge. So, there are instances of human rights violations and millions of peoples and numerous communities continue to face persecution often by their own states. However, UHDR has been successful in constituting a global consensus on these rights and many regional and national institutions have been set up for the protection of these rights. So UDHR along with International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights 1966 uh, and International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights again in 1966 also provide a model for a welfare democratic um, state in which individual can enjoy certain civil, political and socio-economic rights. So together um, uh, with uh, UDHR and these two uh, international covenant on civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights constitute a model for any state to function as a welfare democratic state in which every single individual can enjoy certain political, social and economic uh, rights and to live a dignified moral, um, moral life and uh, meaningful life. So um, the human rights discourse uh, um, provided a kind of uh, mechanism to not just uh, uh, merely discuss or talk about some rights of the individual, but also create a model or a structure of institution which will provide the condition for individual to exercise some of these uh, rights. So this discourse, um, there are also lead to some formation of regional level covenant or discussion and also at the national level also. So for example, there are also regional organization for the monitoring and protection of human rights such as most importantly European Convention on Human Rights in 1950 and US Convention on Human Rights in 1969, similarly African Charter on Human Rights and People Rights 1981. Government of India has also set up a National Human Rights Commission in 1993 and there are many states level human rights commission to monitor and protect human rights in India. So these are some of the discourses, the origin of discourses and the institutional apparatus for the protection and monitoring of human rights. Besides that, there are many NGOs also. Some of the NGOs like Amnesty International or the Human Rights Watch you might be aware of are working on uh, tracking uh, 
the possible or tracking the actual violation of human rights in different countries coming up with different reports and uh, uh, fixing responsibilities and uh, developing uh, awareness about uh, uh, the protection and promotion of these uh, rights in different countries. So, these are some of the things that we have discussed. Now, we will focus specifically on some articles and through that we will try to understand what kind of rights are considered as the human rights. So, uh, before doing that, this quotation of Mother Teresa actually reinforced the point which we have discussed that human rights are not a privilege confirmed by government, they are every human being's entitlement by virtue of his or her humanity. So, this is the basis, the source of human rights and not the government, not the state. State and government is there to protect and promote these rights. They are not the sanctioning authority. So, these rights are understood as entitlements of the individual because of his or her being human and not because of his or her being member of a community or a state or a society or so on. So, state, society, government is there to protect those rights, to promote those rights and they are not the sanctioning authority of these rights. So, um, now we will discuss some of these uh, um, rights uh, uh, particularly as uh, enlisted in the uh, articles of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, it should be Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, Universal Declaration of Human Rights contains 30 articles besides a preamble and many of these rights are overlapping uh, and for the purpose of our discussion, we can club them together into three kinds of rights and we will discuss them uh, each one of them. So, one and most of the rights that is uh, enlisted in these 30 articles are civil and political rights in nature. The second is about economic, social and cultural, uh, cultural rights and finally, groups and collective rights for development and self-determination. Now, to give you this uh, background that it was not easy to arrive at a consensus about what constitute the human rights. So, in the advanced liberal democratic country, the rights that is considered essential for the individual may not be necessarily uh, considered essential in other societies, say for less, uh, less developed societies or countries from Asia and Africa where the organizing principle of um, life is collective life or community lives or group rights or also say for example, the socialist countries or the communist countries which wanted economic uh, or the social um, or the cultural rights should be given more uh, uh, preference than merely political and civil rights. So, there was a contestation about what does it mean to have human rights and which rights can uh, be rightly regarded as the human rights of the individual also a very contested terrain and there it developed a gradual consensus at least among the elites about some rights which are inalienable and which should be regarded as the uh, human rights which has overriding power on certain um, uh, ordinary laws or on other consideration of uh, polity or state. So, as we have discussed Dworkin, that principle we need to uh, remember that rights are not something which can be traded off with some other values, say for the progress of um, uh, larger, largest number, like a utilitarian will argue that a policy and its justification is based on the principle that whether it maximizes the happiness of the greatest number or not. Uh, According to Dworkin and, um, and human rights discourse also that some rights are good in itself, it does not require some other justification or nor it should be traded off with some other political goods uh, or uh, political values. So, these rights must be protected. So, this consensus emerged by uh, constant negotiation or conven uh, conventions, conference or seminars and so on. So, as we have discussed the evolution of not just the discourse on human rights, but also the institutional structure or mechanism 
for the monitoring or protection of human rights is something very unique to 20th century world. So, now we will discuss each of these rights one by one. So, civil and political rights, if you remember in the previous lecture, we have broadly discussed what is civil or what is political rights, but some of these rights that is there which we regard as civil and political rights and these are disproportionately large number of rights in comparison to say socio-economic rights or cultural or group rights and so on. So, civil and political rights are uh, there in article 1 and 2 which talks about human beings should be treated equally irrespective of personal characteristics or citizenship. So, the nationality or the personal characteristics should not be the basis of treating everyone equally. So, this treatment of equality is based on the idea of same equal moral worth. Article 3 talks about life, liberty and security of person. So, that is fundamental rights. Then article 4 and 5 talks about prohibition on slavery or torture. So, no person should be uh, put in the condition of servitude or dependence against his will. So, uh, uh, any practices or policies or the laws which uh, subject a individual or group of individual to the condition of slavery or torture that is the violation of human rights. So, article 4 and 5 prohibit slavery or torture. Now, um, article 6 to 11 talks about equality before the law or equal protection by the state to each individual, right to an effective uh, remedy for violation of one's rights. So, if there is some violation, they all have this same or equal access to uh, uh, the court or to the institution for the protection of uh, their rights. A state and law must treat or protect its uh, citizen equally without any discrimination and so on. Now, um, prohibition on arbitrary arrest or detention. So, the state uh, right or power to detain or arrest a person should not be based on arbitrary principles. So, individual cannot be detained arbitrarily, there must be some legal valid justification for the arrest and det detention and the individual must be informed for his detainment or, uh, or the arrest. So, there are certain rights which protects the individual from the arbitrary arrest and detentions. Then right to free trial, so th that is based on the idea of natural justice that even those who are criminal who is uh, accused of certain crimes must be given free trial. That means, he must have access to defend his case, to argue his case or to prove his innocence and so on. So, presumptions of innocence until proven, proven guilty. So, no individual should be regarded as guilty unless he is proven by the court of law. So, prohibition on retroactive laws that means, for a crime that individual commits today should not be um, 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 persecuted uh, on the law which has a retrospective um, effect. So, uh, for the crime that individual commits, only those law operates which are in operation at the time of that crime. So, the um, suppose someone committed a crime in um, 2015 and there is a new law today that is operational in 2018. Now, this person who committed this crime in 2015, if he is persecuted today cannot be persecuted on the basis of the law which is enacted this year. So, he must be persecuted on the laws which was operational at the time of his or her crime. So, no, uh, so there is a kind of prohibition on the retroactive uh, laws article 6 to 11. Now, prohibition on arbitrary interference in the private life, right to privacy. So, article 12 talks about that. And then, freedom of movement, including immigration, right to asylum in another country that is uh, protected under article 13 and 14. Then, right to own property and prohibition on arbitrary seizure of property, article 17. Now, article 18 is something very uh, crucial which you will find similar to article 19 in Indian constitution. And article 18 talks about freedom of thought, conscience, religion, freedom of opinion and expression, right to peaceful assembly, 
prohibition on compulsion to belong to an association and so on. So, these are some of the broader civil and political rights that is guaranteed in uh, under article 18. Um, article 21 talks about right to political participation, equal access to public services or the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of the government. So, the legitimacy of the government is based on the consent of the people. So, these are some of the rights uh, we have seen that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights contain 30 articles and almost 21 of it talks about civil and political rights. So, this is a kind of disproportionate uh, value that is attached to the civil and political rights which treats individual as an autonomous individual, as a um, member of humanity and not because he or she is member of a particular community or states. So, that is the basis or that is uh, we will discuss while we will conclude this um, human rights uh, discussion that there is then certain legitimate criticism against this kind of disproportionate focus on only civil and political rights which focus on the individual. Now, the second kind of rights that we will discuss is the economic, social and cultural rights that is more about group or the collective, uh, collective rights. So, of course, there is one separate uh, sub topic to that, but it is more towards the collective conditions or the uh, collective lives and so on. So, article 22 to 26 talks about economic, social and cultural rights which means a right to social security that every individual should have certain minimum social security, right to work, everyone should have the employment or opportunities for employment, the free choice of employment, nobody should be forced to do something against his or her will, that means enough employment opportunity should be there. Then equal pay for equal work, there should not be discrimination on the basis of sex, gender, religion and so on in terms of um, rewarding for the same kind of work. So, the equal pay for equal work. Right to just and favorable uh, remuneration. So, the remuneration that one gets for his or her job should not below the minimum threshold. So, we uh, see many states, especially democratic welfare states set certain limits of minimum is and so on. So, right to join trade union, right to rest and leisure, right to adequate standard of living, motherhood or childhood uh, are entitled to special care and assistance, equal protection of children, right to education, right of parents to determine the kinds of education their children receive. So, these are some of the rights which can be regarded as the social economic rights which is protected under article 12 to 16. Now, group or collective rights for development and self-determination, these are basically under article 27, 28, 29 and 30. So, uh, right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community. So, the community lives are also regarded as necessary for the growth and progress of individual which should not be denied only on the basis of him or her personal characteristics or the color of his skin or her skin or uh, his or her level of education and so on. So, in the cultural life of the community, everyone should have the free and equal participation article 27. Now, everybody is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedom set forth in this declaration that means, uh, universal declaration of human rights can be fully realized. So, article 28 talks about that condition of social and international order where the rights and freedom that is part of this declaration can be fully realized. Then uh, article 29 or 30 basically talks about the uh, relationship between uh, the rights of the individual and maintaining public order and morality and thereby posing certain limits or constraints or curtailment of individual rights. So, everyone has duty to his or her community. So, there is a kind of uh, balancing between the individual rights on the one hand and duties and responsibilities of individual towards his or her community. So, the exercise of the above rights can only be limited in order to meet the just requirement of morality, public order and the general welfare in a democratic society. 
So article 29 talks about these rights. Now here we need to think about this idea of what is morality, what is pu public order or what is general welfare and that makes the whole discourse on rights a contested terrain thereby institution of a state or government may use this uh, category of uh, say uh, public order or morality or general welfare uh, in the name of curtailing certain individuals right to property or right to uh, movement, right to seek a profession and so on and so forth. So in the name of uh, protecting or promoting public order or morality, a state may curtail or limit those rights of the individual. So where there is a genuine uh, requirement for limiting some uh, parts of individual rights for the protection of uh, public morality, order and so on, but it can also be misused or abused by the state and its institution for uh, doing something which is not uh, intended or which is not intended to promote the general welfare, but in the name of general welfare they can control the uh, or limit the rights of the individual. Now article 30 talks about nothing in the declaration should imply that any state, group or person can engage in actions destructive of any of the rights and freedom enlisted here. So all the rights that is enlisted in these rights must be protected and no states person or group are supposed to destroy or limit any of these rights that is enlisted. So these are basically three broader categories of rights contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now if we assess these rights that we find the concept of human rights is subject to continuous evolution that means new uh, rights are added to uh, these rights. So uh, as we have discussed there was uh, a universal uh, declaration of human rights and in 1966 there was two uh, convention on political and civil rights and socio-economic rights at the international level and also at the regional and national level there are many uh, institutions or agencies that have been set up to recognize, to promote and protect uh, these rights. Uh, the discourse on human rights has also led to recognition of many rights such as the children rights in different countries. Uh, in our own countries we uh, have seen how many uh, legislation have been passed to abolish child labor and so on and to provide uh, say uh, free education to every children uh, and so on. Now right of indigenous people is again a new kind of discourse. Um, that is um, there in um, international uh, discourse on rights. So in Canada or in US or in Australia, there is legislation for the protection of the indigenous people, for the protection of their culture. In India also we have fifth and sixth schedule that protects certain territory, certain groups of individual and give them some leverage to protect their culture, customs, traditions and so on. So uh, the human rights discourse in, in a sense is a kind of uh, contested complex set of rights often uh, at conflict with each other and it constantly evolves in a sense of new rights are added uh, to the human rights. So uh, the present declaration gives prominence as I have said to the civil and political rights of the human being then it pays due importance to their socio-economic rights in order to strengthen the foundation of these rights, it also highlights individual duties towards the community. Special article 29 uh, talks about those duties of the individual. Now one of the major criticism against the human rights is the fact that in this discourse a state is expected to recognize and protect these rights. However, often a state itself is the violator of these rights. So in many countries, you find the state which is supposed to protect and um, um, promote these rights itself is the perpetrators that means violator of those rights. Now in that uh, sense there is no other effective agency which can enforce these rights. So there can be international pressure, there can be NGOs which may initiate a discussion on the human rights violation in any country 
but ultimately because of the uh, nature of the uh, global politics where a state remains the predominant uh, actor in the domestic affairs of a state when that state becomes the perpetrators or the violator of human rights in that sense there is this idea of interfering in the domestic affairs of the particular state in the name of protecting human rights that means protecting the individuals or communities from their own government now in the name of that we have also seen many countries especially from the advanced uh, countries promoting or pursuing their own selfish economic interest in the name of protecting uh, human rights in any particular country so there are those contestations also so the state itself which remains is the violator and the, in the absence of other effective mechanism implementation of human rights remain one of the biggest challenge so the effective implementation of the human rights is far from satisfactory and individuals and communities continue to face human rights violation in most of the uh, most of the countries so although there are international court of justice or un agency and also ngos like amnesty international or human rights watch and they are doing commendable job in campaigning for say, human rights awareness and monitoring human rights implementation in different countries and also holding the government responsible for its violation however human rights violations are still rampant in different countries we see in middle east or in asia or in africa uh, some of the uh, rights that we have discussed in these three groups of rights are uh, uh, denied to majority of population so that remains uh, the rampant however it lead to a discourse where now we increasingly talks about eradicating poverty or uh, say uh, freedom from curable disease and so on so uh, the united nation programs like millennium development goals or the sustainable development goals uh, now is uh, a direction uh, is in is uh, are initiatives in this direction to create a society where everyone will not just have political and uh, legal equality or political and civil rights but also the social economic and cultural conditions of living where these political and civil rights will be more meaningful so however there are uh, some other criticism against uh, human rights also uh, human rights are also criticized on the grounds that it is the product of a particular context of 18th century waste and its imposition by many countries are seen as a form of imperialism so in the name of protecting human rights there are undue interference in the domestic matters of many countries by the developed countries so many countries especially from the global south see this discourse on human rights as part of developed countries pursuit for economic interest so there is cultural uh, biasness also where uh, it is seen as the product of a particular geographical historical context of 16th to 18th century europe and from there it is transcended or it is kind of internationalized where every country is supposed to recognize protect and promote these rights so uh, besides this cultural biasness it is also argued that human rights favor individualism over the collectivity or the community lives of many uh, non western countries and societies and this we have discussed in asian value debates where the focus on the selfish motive or interest of the individual that is the basis of uh, western theory social and political theory and the asian value which promotes uh, loyalty or uh, duty towards community or community lives and so on and the, especially in the multicultural communitarian critiques we have seen some of these uh, tensions between understanding individual as the autonomous self defining being and therefore carrying certain rights and individual being embedded in his or her community so uh, there is a kind of critique to uh, human rights which favors individualism over the collectivity and give primacy to negative and positive uh, negative uh, rights over the positive rights and political and civil rights which is disproportionately given more share in this declaration on human rights to the socio economic and the cultural rights of the individual so now we'll discuss about rights and duties so rights it is said 
have no meaning without duties and one person's right necessarily involves the another person's duties or vice versa. So, the rights and duties must go hand in hand. Now, this idea of rights and duties should go uh, together is carefully pointed out by Harold Jelowski in his text A Grammar of Politics in 1983, where he writes that the position of rights does not mean the position of claims that are empty of all duties. Our rights are not independent of society, but inherent in it. So, to provide for me the condition which enable me to be my best self is to oblige me at the same time to seek to be my best self, to protect me against attack from others is to imply that I myself will desist from attacking others. So, therefore, my rights or the rights that is given to me is meaningful only on the condition when I recognize the similar rights to the other and uh, there, that recognition of similar rights to other obliges me to do some things I, uh, or to have obligation and responsibility towards others. So, the conditions which enables the exercise of rights is possible only in a society or in a society there is no just one individual, there are other uh, individuals uh, also. Now, so one individual rights therefore, is at conflict with others individual rights in a sense that the rights of one is not absolute, it has to be balanced with the rights of others. So, uh, that mutual recognition is necessary or the mutual obligation to each other's right is necessary for the uh, exercise of one's right. So, uh, so that is at one level the society and uh, the individual. The second level of this uh, relationship is between the state and the uh, individual or uh, society on the other hand. So, the relationship between individual society and state is somewhat mediated through this recognition of certain rights and also the corresponding duties and responsibilities. So, rights without uh, duties are meaningless claims. It puts an obligation on the individual to fight for the protection of rights, which is necessary not only for him, but also for everyone else. So, it necessarily entails one's obligations and duties towards others. So, the uh, discourse on rights and struggle for rights is meaningful or have a justification not because it is meaningful for a person but it is meaningful for everyone in that society or in that groups and that makes these claims legitimate claims that makes these claims to be recognized and therefore turned into a, uh, a legal rights or uh, the social rights uh, that uh, a society or a state may may recognize so the discourse on rights are claims which is not merely for a single individual but for every single individual in that society or community which gives the rights or claim a particular strength in that society. So, rights often conflict with each other and in the absence of duties, excessive discourse on rights may lead to even more conflicts, violence and uh, chaos. So, think about a society where every individual is only worried about his or her uh, rights and those rights are guaranteed and they refuse or deny to do corresponding uh, duties or responsibility for the exercise of those rights. Now, that will lead to inherent conflict, violence or chaos in the society. So, uh, uh, Gandhi therefore argued that if we do our duties, so he uh, his starting point is from the other side. So, he argued that if we do our duties, our rights will be automatically taken care of. So, as many liberals and many other theorists of rights that we have argued, natural rights theorists, legal rights and so on, uh, Ronald Dworkin, that the starting point is that individual has certain rights and those rights must be recognized and protected by the society and the state. Here in Gandhi, we see that each individual should must 
be uh, conscious of his duties and actually worried about performing and his or her duties and everyone so if uh, everyone does so then the rights of the individual or the community or the groups or the culture will be automatically taken care of so in gandhian uh, approach uh, really there is no need to struggle for rights or fight for the rights if uh, everyone is willing to do his or her duties towards other uh, towards uh, the society towards the community and so on so his focus was on duties rather than excessive uh, emphasis on on the rights so article 29 in the universal declaration of human rights also focuses on everyone's duties towards their community so it is also said that an individual would be entitled to the rights and freedoms only on the conditions recognizing similar rights and freedoms of the others and of meeting just requirements of morality public order and general welfare of a democratic society so these are some of the grounds which uh, enables the individual to uh, exercise his rights so basically uh, uh, the exercise of one's right is based on this idea that the uh, one is also equally uh, obliged to do certain duty or responsibilities towards other to recognize their rights to exercise the similar rights that he or she claims against society or the state now uh, to conclude this lecture on rights we uh, can rephrase some of the things which we have discussed over the three lectures first that rights are claims or entitlements of the individual against society or state so rights are enabling conditions or a, a kind of claim against a state or society these claims or rights are regarded as necessary for the proper development and progress of the individual however all the claims that an individual makes is not regarded as rights that we have discussed so these uh, rights are individual claims or entitlements against society and state for his or her due or proper progress or development however all the claims uh, that individual makes against the society or state is not Uh, regarded as rights for the claims to be regarded as rights it must be recognized by the society so individual can make 100 claims but all the claims cannot be regarded as the rights for the claims to be recognized as rights it must be recognized by the society at the collective level and also by the state and once the state recognize certain uh, rights those rights becomes the legal rights against whom individual can go to the court for the protection of those rights however the other kinds of rights for example moral rights or human rights individual do not have uh, uh, or it cannot be enforced in the court of law so there were, there are some of those differences which we have discussed so we have discussed how discourse on rights is rooted in nat- natural rights theory we have also discussed the difference between the positive rights or negative rights that means rights which invite the state to do certain things to have proactive roles in providing the condition for individual to exercise certain rights so for the example providing uh, quality and uh, accessible education to everyone or medical care and so on those rights of individual are positive rights which requires the proactive roles of the state and the society there are certain negative right uh, which uh, restrain the state from doing certain things so right to life right to freedom of speech and expression and so on can be regarded as the negative rights so then we have also discussed the difference between moral rights and legal rights civil and political rights on the one hand and social economic rights on the other we have also discussed the conflicts between different theories of rights such as libertarian communitarian and multiculturalist per- perspective on rights and also asian value debates today we have discussed the human rights and uh, relationship between rights and duties so rights are often at conflict with each other and without duties it has no meaning so both rights and duties should uh, go together and right also requires justification and there could be reasonable restriction to rights in order to promote public order morality and general welfare of the society and so on 
So, rights protect the individual or groups from the tyranny of society or state. Human rights discourse and institutional apparatus have led to empowerment of many vulnerable and persecuted communities in the world and it protects them from their own state or government. And this is the biggest contradiction in the right discourse also, where a state which is supposed to recognize and protect these rights uh, are often its violators too. And therefore, the citizen and the civil society groups must remain ever vigilant for the protection of these rights. So, these rights or claims or entitlements are uh, something which require the vigilance on the part of citizen and also the civil society because the uh, authority of the state are often seen as the um, uh, violator of these rights in the name of say public order, morality or uh, general welfare of the uh, individual. So, you may be aware of the uh, tussle in Indian constitution between directive principle of a state policy which intends to promote the general welfare of the uh, Indian people, especially the weaker, marginalized or the poor people and the fundamental rights which protect certain civil and political rights or democratic rights of the individual and the groups. So, which should be given primacy to uh, which? Should we go for the political and civil rights and must protect it at the cost of so, uh, social and economic rights? or should we promote social and economic rights at the cost of political and civil rights. So, these are the some of the inherent tensions in the discourse on rights as to which rights should be given primacy to uh, which rights and uh, uh, that requires the uh, vigilance on the part of citizen and the civil society to hold the government or the authority accountable for those rights. So, uh, that is all for today's lecture on uh, rights. Uh, some of the readings that you can look for are uh, these for this lecture on rights. So, thanks for listening that is all for today and let us know what you think about these lectures. Thank you.